the Welcome to Facts webinar called Goat Herding Basics. Our presenter is Annie Warmke. This webinar is presented by, uh, hosted by Food Animal Concerns Trust or Facts. I am Larissa McKenna, Facts Humane Farming Program Director, and I will be moderating the webinar today. Thank you all so much for joining us. It is really wonderful to have so many folks in the audience today. So to begin just with a few introductions, Food Animal Concerns Trust or Fact, we are a national nonprofit organization. We are headquartered in Illinois, and we promote the safe and humane production of meat, milk, and eggs. I direct Fact's Humane Farming Program, which provides a number of opportunities for livestock and poultry farmers to increase the number of animals that are raised humanely. And this webinar is part of our Humane Farming webinar series. Please visit our website to learn more about our farmer services and to register for an upcoming webinar. So at this time, I am really honored to introduce our very experienced presenter, Annie Warmke. Along with her husband, Jay, Annie owns and operates Blue Rock Station, a sustainable living center located in southeastern Ohio. They raise llamas, laying hens, pigs, and of course, goats. Annie frequently leads workshops in cheese making and goat herding and is the author of The Naturally Healthy Goat Reference Guide. I'm honored that Annie is, is with us today to talk about her experience raising goats, and she'll be available to answer your questions later on in this webinar. So with that, I am going to let Annie get started with her presentation. Annie, it's all yours. Well, thank you, Larissa, and I welcome everybody. It's great that there's so many people from so many places in the United States. And I think there are also some people listening from a project that I work with in Uganda, so it's kind of cool. Um, I want to start out by just uh, drawing attention to the disclaimer that's on the slide uh, just after the introduction. And just so that you know that I'm not a veterinarian and I don't even want to be. And I'm here just to share information based on what I've learned and uh, and uh, so just so you understand where we're all coming from. The, the, the world of goat herding or the business of goats, uh, whichever you are interested in, um, is, a, is pretty interesting these days. And, and one of the things that I find really fascinating is uh, to follow along on Facebook or other social media. Um, just looking at what people do to get started with goat herding, and I'm, I'm not sure if this is true in the world of sheep herding or horses or cattle, but what I see happening is people have great uh, affinity for goats, and goats are pretty intelligent and they're really terrific with human beings and, um, and being small ruminants, they are easily handled compared to maybe if you think about cattle or a cow, which if it steps on you, you're going to be in the emergency room or maybe even dead. Um, but what I see happening in the goat world right now through social media is that people go out and they haven't prepared anything. Uh, and this is a, is a big portion of people getting goats today. They aren't ready. They didn't create infrastructure. They don't have knowledge that they've researched on how to daily take care of the animal, let alone if there's an emergency. Oftentimes, the goat will be pregnant, or uh, maybe she's just had kids, or worse, the absolute worst scenario being that they take the babies are born and people bring home a day-old uh, kid that they're going to try to get onto a bottle. And so a lot of times, what we like to say is if you have livestock, you're going to have dead stock. And that sounds horrible, but I'll tell you, when you start out with an, a sick animal, which lots of people end up in that position, they feel bad, they go to the livestock auction and they see that goat there and it looks so pitiful or maybe it's a baby and they're not prepared for what they're bringing home. Maybe they're bringing home parasites, maybe they're bringing home uh, other issues, diarrhea, and Goats have a unique system, and it requires some knowledge to get it right. And it's not enough to just get it right. We have to, we have to do a good job because, as a farmer and a goat herder, if I do my job properly 
and then step out of the way, that animal is going to get it right and work really hard for me. So I'd like to just talk about why that's of value. The problem we have in life is that we all often start out like Christopher Columbus. When he left Spain and had the funding of Queen Isabella, he um, didn't know where he was going. When he got there, he didn't know where he was. He thought he was in one location when, in fact, he never ended up where he had intended. And he really massacred whole cultures. And, um, and then when he came home, he didn't know where he'd been. And that's not the way uh, to do business in, in any industry, let alone the goat world. So one of the questions that we have to ask ourselves is, where do we begin? And it isn't with going and buying an animal and then figuring out how it's going to be housed and how it's going to stay confined um, and all of that that goes into that infrastructure. Where we need to begin is what is it we want to accomplish by owning that animal or creating a goat herd? And is it that we want to start a business that earns a living or just uh, cover our expenses, whatever that is? We just want to have fun with the animals. Um, lots of people are in 4-H, so they are looking. In fact, they probably already have bought their animals for the year, and there are certain criteria that have to be met by that. Or maybe we're trying to change the world and saying goat milk is, you know, the next best thing to slice bread, and um, and we want to convince people that that's a, a really great thing in life, and um, and you know, go with that. So, but what is that? What is your goal? What is your mission in having that animal or that uh, that herd? So we have to kind of set a course for ourselves. And in setting that course, we have to decide a few things before it's all going to work. And if, particularly if you're going to start uh, a goat herd with the idea that you are going to make money from it. And lots of people have goats, but they haven't figured out how to make money. A lot of people get discouraged right at the very beginning and decide to abandon the animals that they bought, uh, taking them to the auction or finding people to buy them. So what we have to do is say, all right, if we're going to be in the business of goats, there are a few things we need to know. First of all, who is the leader? Uh, in, in, at our farm, even though I give a lot of credit to my husband, who is, we call him Mr. Fix-It, uh, but he is not the farmer, nor does he aspire to be the farmer. And, um, and, and I am the lone farmer, and I'm clear that I'm the leader. I make the decisions on what happens with the farm and the herd and so forth. I have a mission statement, and in that mission statement, I have three or four lines about what I want to do. And so Blue Rock Station is the name of uh, our business and um, also the name of our farm. And uh, in that mission statement, we have outlined about four sentences. And in the mission statement, we say, uh, our mission is to have fun at what we do, not work for anybody else, and uh, repurpose, reuse, recycle, respect. And, uh, and, and that's what drives our, our business. We also need to decide on a business plan, no matter how simple that is. So maybe your business plan is you're going to raise uh, dairy goats or meat goats, and you're going to um, have a kidding season. And during that kidding season, you're going to have some visitors that will pay you to come and see the babies and uh, serve milk and you know create a, a, a milk herd share. But however you're going to do it, you need to write it down because when you write something down, it creates a, a message on your brain in indelible ink that um, basically reminds you why you're doing what you do, especially when you get discouraged. It's good to be able to go back and look at that. You're also going to need to create a realistic budget because the truth is it costs money to be in business and it costs money to make money. If you're just doing it for fun, maybe you don't care how much you spend because it's not an issue. But for most folks, it's going to be an issue. And if you ever want to go out and borrow money, which I don't highly recommend, but let's say you, you need uh, a loan from the Farm Service Agency or the USDA or the bank or your neighbor or your mom or your dad, um, 
if you have a simple budget that shows just the basics, you know, what's it cost to, to have a feed, to, to buy feed, to buy the hay, what is it, and, and you can go online and find formulas uh, that will give you an idea of how much hay per goat, how much uh, feed per goat, and, um, and, and then you, how, how much for repairs, how much for infrastructure, how much for taxes, for whatever payments you might have for the farm, and just to create a, a general picture of what does it cost, so what are the expenses, and then the other part is what are the income? What is the income? So the income oftentimes the first year up to maybe five years may be in the minus column because it takes time to build up a business. And, uh, and I'm not going to go into that per se, uh, although we do teach a class about that. But um, it, it's just important to understand that it takes time, it takes money to make money. And if you don't create a picture for yourself, uh, you don't know where you're going, and you definitely will not know where you are when you get there. It's really vital to make a list of people and businesses and maybe organizations that are going to support what you're about to do. So if you have a partner in life, a husband, wife, uh, lover, whatever, that shares your life with you, and they say, there is no way on God's green earth that I want to do any of this, then you're probably not going to succeed. So even if that person is never going to lift a bale of hay or ever shut the gate because you didn't get home in time, you've got to have support. And uh, if everybody's telling you you can't do it, you, you will live up to that expectation. So I encourage you to write down as we're talking maybe three or four people, uh, organizations, or um, uh, businesses in your community or in your general area or your region uh, who would support what you're about to do. I mean, a lot of communities w that have small municipalities or like where I live, uh, you know, we're a distance from a town, but there's a group of people around that have businesses. So they want to support what we're doing because we, when we have visitors, we often try to send them to some of these other farms or places where people can, for example, offer um, uh, a night's stay. So a couple of farms have developed a whole business around our business uh, because people come here for tours, they come here for different classes, and we also have a goat college. So people come to goat college and they need a place to stay. And so we would rather them support the local people around us rather than drive back to town and stay in the Fairfield Inn or one of those places. Plus it's a lot nicer unless you want to go swimming. So who are those supporters? And again, I can't say enough about that. But then also, who are your non-supporters? So maybe it is that person that you live with every day or your kids. Uh, maybe we, we had uh, a lot of tough times when we first started because People really didn't understand what we were trying to do with our business, and uh, those don't always come with the uh, highest uh, esteem that people, <laughs> they tend to think those eat everything and, uh, and they're trouble. So uh, we got a, you know, a nasty letter that said, we don't like you because you eat salad. And that was really strange because I thought everybody ate salad. So, uh, at some point, they came and killed one of our animals and uh, because they didn't like us. And we're the most peace-loving, smart, clever, great supporters of others, and uh, it was a hard time to deal with. But again, so if we recognize that we have people who, not just people in our families or in our business connections that aren't going to support us, we can at least deal with that. If we don't list that as part of our business plan, it doesn't work very well. And then lastly, who's going to be your customer? Maybe your customer is somebody who wants goat kids today, but then you plan to create um, a milk CSA or a herd share, or you want to just sell kids uh, to people, or you want to sell um, pack animals. Uh, so who is that customer, and where are they going to come from? And how are you going to find that customer? And with the internet today, 
uh, that's not too hard to do. I know we couldn't do what we do today if it wasn't for the internet. So next, it's important to understand and uh, what are what are the special skills that you possess to reach your goals. Again, writing down those goals, you know what they are, and so you're going to say, "Yes, I'm good at animal husbandry. Um, I'm good at talking to people, or I, in my business world, I'm good at marketing." These are all skill sets that are absolutely required if you're going to end up uh, making a living. Or even if it's just 4-H, you've got to understand marketing because the whole point of 4-H is to do a good job. So you go to the fair and you get a prize and everybody, you know, is encouraged and thrilled that young people are doing these things. So what are three or four skills that you possess? And I hope you're writing some of these things down because uh, when you're done and you go back and look at it, it will give you a general idea of if you're going in the right direction or maybe you need to rethink what you're about to do. Or maybe you're already doing it and you need to rethink how you're doing it. So what are the skills that you need to learn and how will you learn them? So attending webinars, especially if you live in rural areas, that's a great way uh, to learn new information. I know I've learned tons about social media by attending webinars, and also um, a lot of things about pasture management, which is vital to uh, health for goats. And um, FACT, which is the group sponsoring this webinar, have some really great webinars, uh, and you can visit their website and see more about that. So write down a couple of things that you need to learn, and then where are you going to learn them? Are you going to take a class? Are you going to join a mentoring program? Uh, lots of groups. Uh, including FACT, are uh, doing some mentoring kinds of programs. In Ohio, the um, Ohio Education Food and Farm Association called OFA uh, has a very big mentoring program right now. There's money from the government um, to fund some of those. And I'm not familiar with other states, but if you look around, I think you'll find that uh, mentoring is a great way to learn what you want to learn about those. And then um, the other thing is maybe internships, if you have that flexibility. We have an internship program, and it's mostly people under 30 uh, who come and during the warm season and live with us and uh, study sustainability and how it applies to every single thing we do in life. So next, what resources do I have? And what resources do I need? And this is a vital question to ask. Because you want to jump into the goat world, or maybe you're already in the goat world, but you're trying to figure out how do I deal with the parasite load. And maybe you uh, are feeding hay on the ground. And so one of the things you might think about is how do I raise that hay up so it's not on the ground. Um, so what are the resources I have with my, my physical location, my land? Maybe I only have a half an acre. Maybe I have a thousand acres. So but what are those resources? And what are the resources on the land? So are there fences? Are there um, buildings, water, uh, any number, whatever is existing, rocks? I mean, rocks are great for goats. Uh, good pasture, good neighbors, good fences between the neighbors, electricity where you need it. Uh, maybe you've got solar where you need it, water that can be pumped or not. Maybe it's standing, but to, to say, what are those resources? And really make a list because that's where you begin to see maybe there are other ways I can make money uh, so I can, I have a variety of sources for creating revenue and not just from one particular one because we live in a time when uh, it's not a good idea to just have one source of income unless it's, you know, $50 million in the bank and maybe that's not even enough today. But um, so if we have a variety of ways to, to, um, to make money through our resources and our knowledge, uh, it's good to massage that into several different ways of uh, paths or uh, lanes of revenue. What are the rules and regulations and standards that you're going to have to comply with in your region? So of course the state, the US government has rules regulations and standards that apply sometimes or don't apply. The state that you live in has these 
rules, regulations, and standards. And then even you might go as minute as the township you live in uh, has these rules, regulations, and standards. So if you're going to keep goats, you need to know what they are. And, and I like to say, it, unless you know what the rules are, you can't break them. And that's a really important thing to remember. And I'm not going to go into that today. We can spend the whole day talking about that. But those rules and regulations and those standards are something that are going to drive your success or, or ruin your success. And one of the times that we're living in now that the challenge is that a lot of rules and regulations and standards that apply to farm production, whether it's goats or, or food, uh, is that those rules are set up to try to, to control the really big producers. And most of you that are on this line, if not all of you and, and myself, we're small producers. But we have to find out how do we comply or how do we get around some of those rules and regulations uh, that apply to things like herd share, uh, raw milk in particular, um, if we're going to make cheeses or sell raw milk, or CSA which is, uh, you know, groups of people that want to buy uh, your products uh, on a regular basis and, and pre-sign up with you. The other thing is, what's your climate? You know, maybe it's not the right climate for goats, or maybe it's perfect for goats, or maybe, you know, you know now I've got to have a barn that's heated somewhere, so I'm when the goat's kid, there's some place for them to get in because it's five below zero, and ears and noses and feet will get frosted, and I lose all of my goat herd. Um, it's really important, and it's not just to look at it today, but to look at some of the projections of how climate is changing. Whether you believe in climate change or not, the reality is that the planet is warming up. And I just saw some projections on that uh, for North America in particular. Winters are going to be milder, but summers are going to be really, really hot. And uh, over the course of the next 100 years, well, I'm not going to live another 100 years, but I need to know if I'm going to create a farm and I want to make money and then maybe I want to leave that to my kids, how do I create infrastructure and how do I create the right combination to account for these changes that are going to happen? Developments and improvements. What kind of fencing will I have to have? Maybe I have fencing, but it's not the right kind. Goats require a specific kind of fencing so that they cannot escape and so that they can put their feet up on it and put their weight on it repeatedly, and also not to get their heads caught in the fencing and die either of a broken neck from being uh, head-butted or because they can't, they can't get out of the fence. Maybe you don't have water in the right place, so you've got to either carry that water or pump that water or collect that water off of a roof. So what are those developments uh, over time and improvements that you're going to need to make in order to, um, in order to do well? And then are there other attractions in your area? So let's say you want to sell, uh, like I worked with a, a, a farm that had dairy cattle, and when the... Uh, I'm sorry, dairy cows. Um, and so when the cows were a certain age, they would butcher the cow and, um, and sell the meat from it. And they wanted people to come to them because, again, knowing the rules, regulations, and standards, if they went off farm to sell uh, and meet somebody uh, where they lived, it was against the law. So they created a, a little map that we helped them design that showed that there were other places that they could visit um, if they wanted to drive out to this farm and buy meat. And they were told, you know, bring the cooler and an ice pack and all that. And then they would either, the customer would go and visit another farm or another amusement place, or maybe there's a you pick pumpkins kind of place. And, um, and so it was a great way to bring business to the area, but also People that are going to drive a distance, they want to know, is there something else to do? Or maybe we're going to stay all night and make a weekend of it. And so it helps everybody in the community. So I'm going to stop here uh, for one minute and see, uh, Larissa, if, if we have any other um, any questions that seem pertinent that I ought to try to answer right now. Yes, we had one question um, about using goats on invasive control for wetland reserve easements. Um, 
would goats help with controlling reed canary grass or, um, uh, yeah, is, is that something that you'd like to speak to, Annie? Sure. Well, first of all, goats are not grass animals. They're foragers. And they are looking, their home naturally is the woodland, the forest. And so whatever plants are available to them um, need to be something besides just grass. And uh, they are great for invasive species, but more in line with woody plants like uh, Japanese honeysuckle and, um, oh, Jesus, my brain is like any kind of trumpet vine or poison ivy, poison oak. Uh, they love that. They'll take it right out, and they'll keep it eaten off. Um, they're good at eating off saplings. They love sassafras. Uh, it, most any kind of uh, tree that has a little sapling, and they like maple leaves. So that they really are so much better at being in an environment where they eat a little of this and a little of that, and then they move on and they eat a little of this and a little of that. And if you want to have a healthy goat, that's how you've got to do it. So anything else before I go? I'm on this slide. What will it take to make a living? Um. Let me see. Um, I just want to mention to folks that that joined a little late that this is being recorded and uh, the, a copy of the recording as long as well as the slides will be um, available later today or tomorrow. So okay. there you go. Uh, all right, thanks. So what will it take to make a living? And this is really important because we need to understand that it's going to take persistence. It's going to take financial resources, and as we talked earlier, it's going to take commitment from others. And if you don't have that in place, then, of course, we're talking about how do you make that happen. So, first, I apologize that I haven't been telling you I'm going to the next slide. So, I'm at the next slide. Now that we've settled all that, uh, things to consider before the ghosts arrive. So, this isn't about going to the auction and looking at one and having pity and then bringing it home and figuring out this is what we need to do in order to start a business or start a herd and do it so we have the best possible chance of a good outcome for everything involved. So people often ask me, what breed should I get? And I, my answer is, what one looks good to you? Because you're already going to tell me, I want to have meat goats or I want to have milk goats. I want to raise kids. I want to have an animal that can give me uh, different options for making money from the same animal. So there are lots of uh, opportunities to check online and look at different breeds. Um, some are higher milk producers than others. Uh, we don't have lots of selection around uh, meat choices in this country as far as meat goes. But anyway, so what's the purpose? And, and if you're just looking for goats that are going to eat brush for you or be a companion to another animal or be a pack animal, then you're going to look at what are called weathers, W-E-T-H-E-R-S. And those are uh, males that have been banded or castrated when they're small, and they are going to be, uh, you know, an asset, and they can live on those, those raspberry vines or those or a bunch of rose or that honeysuckle. They don't need to have uh, supplemental feed. And the only time they're going to require hay is if you're going to pin them up or in the winter when those things may not be available in your area. Um, in terms of meat goats, you can have dairy goats that you uh, have butchered and used as meat. So it is interchangeable. It's just that meat goats are made specifically for their meat. and I don't think the taste is that different, although somebody may dispute that. Uh, I think it's a matter of that that meat goat is bulkier, more muscular versus the, the dairy goat. Uh, in terms of hides, there are markets for hides, and I do have a, a paper on how to, how to um, uh, process a hide. Even if you're not processing it yourself, you, you're, if you're sending it away, you still have to know a few things about that. And I also suggest you can go to YouTube or, um, well, I would say YouTube. There are a lot of uh, videos on there and uh, informational pieces, of audio, that you can learn more about hides. 
something that we don't think about is the the poop or the manure, and that is a really great. Uh, source of fertilizer because you can spread it because of the fact that it's in pellets versus uh, like a cow that has a flat um, and I don't know the technical name for the different forms of poo. I just know that goat poo is uh, is highly um, useful and so it can be spread on gardens without burning the plants. You can make a tea of water uh, and the poo to use as a fertilizer and um, it's, the, it's a great source of a little tiny bit of nitrogen and a balance of phosphorus and potassium. And those are the three things that any plant needs. And most plants don't need that much nitrogen unless they're setting, um, setting the fruit. And so that poo can really serve you well. We, we use what we call deep bedding uh, in the winter so that as they poo, the hay builds up and it creates a nice warm mattress for them. And then that all gets taken out. Uh, it actually gets churned up. We bring the pigs in and feed it with some corn. And then the pigs get everything churned up so it's easy for me to load onto the mule. And um, off we go. And we put that in a, uh, a place where it can get churned one more time with a bobcat. And then it's ready to be put on to, um, to our raised beds. And then also fun. You know, one of the things that I enjoy about goats is they're really great companion to human beings, and they're they're whimsical and and funny, and they laugh with humans, and um, and they just you know they like to be with you. So considering and and different goats have different personality. They each have their own personality. So uh, you can go online and read lots about the psychology of uh, goat herds, and that's one of my specialties and. You can uh, look at, you know, like how goats recognize each other and have their favorites. And I'm not making this up. They've done testing in Australia and uh, England that show a lot of different things about goats and their personalities. And this is really important if you really want your herd to work for you, is to understand how that herd functions and who's in charge of that herd uh, at different times. And then how are you going to house these animals? Uh, I see people online saying, I don't have any kind of housing. Will it bother them to be out in the snowstorm? So that person should get out of goat herding because goats are, they get sick very easily if there's a draft or they're left in rain or snow. And um, they need to be in where it's protected just like you do, just like the chickens do. Uh, and so they require housing. It doesn't have to be something expensive. It could be some cattle panels that are bent over in a uh, like a rounded shape and a tarp over top of it uh, with some hay, but that they've got to have it. And then, of course, the right fencing, which I mentioned earlier. Um, you can use portable fencing. I don't recommend. Well, I I would be very um, against using the uh, like the Premier fencing that the Premier One has fencing that. I've used for um, uh, chickens and turkeys to move them, but a goat gets their horns caught in um, in that web and it keeps electrocuting them. They're they're going to die. So they they can have electric fence, but we do what we call kindergarten, and we bring them into a small area where the not the premier web fencing, but um, like a horse tape, uh, several layers several um, lines of horse tape that go up a four-foot uh, pole. And so they get used to that fencing. They're trained to that fencing. So they're not going to go out and fling themselves into the fencing and then be tortured by it. Um, or you can just have you know, regular fencing. Um, and there are several different kinds. And I, I don't have that right in front of me. But uh, you want to have smaller uh, gauge at the bottom, and then you can have larger gauge at the top so they can't really get their heads stuck in there. And then feed. What are you going to do about feed? If you're going to have animals that are not reproducing or making milk, lactating, then they can probably live on the, the brambles and the honeysuckle and the things that are out there that they're going to forage. Uh, if they are going to be pregnant or they are going to lactate, then they're going to have to have some kind of ration, as they call it, uh, that's going to bump up the calories, going to bump up the minerals. Um, and speaking of minerals, there's a lot that needs to be said about that. In 
in North America. We're very deficient in copper and selenium and um, iron in the soils in many, many places. And I highly suggest when you're talking about one of your resources is to do a soil test. And I have been sadly disappointed about the extension agent uh, agencies uh, use um, the lab that they use. It's it's really not uh, showing an, as I think a, a well-rounded enough um, picture of the soil. So uh, I use a company out of um, out of Michigan, but there are any number of companies. Ohio Earth Foods in Ohio does a really good job of uh, soil testing and then working with you to uh, create a better soil um, for copper and selenium and calcium and all the things, all those trace minerals that that goat requires because the trace minerals are really what helps them to have health. So goats are waiting to be discovered in the marketplace. And I think that's what we have sort of ignored in our lives. We're just like, well, we'll get a milk goat, and that goat will produce some milk for us. So goats have an average milk production of six to eight pounds uh, in a 305-day period. And then if, when we say that, what we mean is the rest of those days, she's going to be uh, pregnant. So the other uh, 60 days of the year, she's going to be pregnant. She's going to be pregnant part of that time, but on average, people will dry a goat up uh, once they are pregnant or certainly by the end of the second month of pregnancy. And, um, and goat milk is measured by the pound and not by the quart or the gallon, and so that's why it always says pound. And it has a really good butter fat, uh, which is actually slightly higher than uh, for cows. And then also one of the reasons, there are a couple reasons why goat milk is tolerated better by people who have lactose intolerance. And one is that it's naturally homogenized, meaning that the fat uh, is incorporated into the milk. Uh, when, she, when you milk her, she's going to have that already mixed up so that there isn't fat, for the most part, there isn't fat that raises to the top. Uh, when a goat first kid, those first Three days or so, you will get a lot of a lot of butter fat um, because uh, she's you know she's giving that kid lots and lots of really rich uh, nutrients so that it's got what it needs to to go the distance. So what could go wrong? We've got this great goat herd. Everybody looks good um, in the goat world and probably in the human world. What can go wrong? It can it, can, it will go wrong. And so we always say, expect the unexpected. So it's really great to have and important to have some kind of a box or a container of some sort. I use a Rubbermaid bin, and then I have a series of drawers that I keep things in, and it's marked uh, to have a medicine chest. And the medicine chest needs to have a variety of things. Uh, one of the things you'll find most useful are plastic syringes of different sizes, uh, and of course, you might have needles for those, but they're really good for sometimes feeding uh, a goat when there's a problem getting the whatever you need down their throat. It has a variety of uses. Uh, number one thing: have a thermometer that can be used rectally uh, and mark on it, not for human use, because sometimes you have people in your life who look for something and then. I've never had this happen, but I have heard that the rectal thermometer for the goat ended up in the house. So uh, don't do not do that. But you, the first thing you should do when there's a problem is take that goat's temperature. And hopefully you've created a little booklet that has um, all the information about that goat. And you know what that goat's temperature is normally. So you'll know, is it running a temperature or not? And babies tend to have a lower temperature than, um, than adults. So you might want to take that temperature when they're little, but then redo an average temperature when they're older. Um, you'll want to have a variety of needles, and you'll want to have the ability to um, to give shots. Uh, that always makes me incredibly nervous, but it's uh, the goat world. And lots of us live where we don't have a big, a large animal vet, or we don't have a large animal vet that knows anything about goats. And this is a big problem in lots of areas. Um, surgical scissors. I do try to have 
uh, disposable scalpels, and that has been very helpful to me a couple of times in an emergency situation. Surgical gloves, you can buy a box of surgical gloves, cheaply enough, a hundred of them. And I don't use them all the time, but I definitely have them for when uh, the goats are kidding. And I keep some of those elastic um, hair bands that, for a ponytail, and because uh, the gloves all seem to come really large. And when I put the glove on, I just slide that band over the uh, over my wrist and hold the glove in place. But I also use it like if I'm dealing with a situation where that goat uh, has something uh, is sick, uh, I'm going to handle everything um, with some uh, some cover on my hand to protect myself as well. Um, I like to keep things like acidophilus. Acidophilus is the bacteria that comes from plain yogurt, and uh, I buy a dry powdered form of it called baby dophilus because it's not in a capsule, and that's my go-to for a lot of things. If there's something going on with the gut, uh, if there's a wound, it's one of the things that I use is to put that healthy bacteria in the body or in the wound. Um, I also have blood stop powder, and I have used that a lot. Uh, when you trim hooves, you can you can make a mistake really easily. All you need is that goat to decide she's done and jerk, and maybe uh, you really cut too close or you hit her with the uh, trimmers. Um, I will also keep a big jar of cayenne pepper. Cayenne pepper uh, will be great. It is great at stopping uh, heavy bleeding. Um, I have a tube of Nutri Drench, and I, I'm not very big on commercial things, but it's a high energy. So if you have a goat that's just kitted and she's needing some help, or maybe there's been a shock, like I had a kid once that uh, was stung by um, a hornet under its collar and it started having seizures and hyperventilating, and um, we used the Nutri Drench to help him. Um, electrolytes. Uh, I just use molasses, a mixture of molasses and um, uh, apple cider vinegar, and I keep that mixed up uh, in the barn in a plastic gallon jug in case I need it for some reason. And um, I have vet wraps, and I also keep uh, bee propolis. And we can talk a little bit about that, but a bee propolis with raw honey is a great healer of wounds, very quickly healing of wounds because it pulls the um, healthy tissue from around the wound into the wound, and it can close up a very big hole in an animal pretty quickly. So I, these are my go-tos. I also think you need to have locks and good gate latches. Uh, I've tried lots of different goat latches, and the ones I have right now I got for Christmas, if you can believe it. And uh, uh, they're really great because I can cause the gate, gate to go either way, and it latches automatically, and it's just really great. Um, but goats can unlock goat uh, uh, latches. They can, they'll watch you and uh, and they'll see what you do, and then they can imitate. And certainly, not every goat, not every goat is fantastically intelligent, but there's always one. Uh, again, expect the unexpected. And then the toolbox with bolt and wire cutters. Uh, I have a lot of different tools, but I found that the one thing, I, of course, a hammer, a really nice hammer that works for you. Uh, but bolt and wire cutters because I've had to retire wires, I've had to cut goats out of fence, um, and it's always an emergency. It's not a matter of running to find one. So I keep all of that in my milk room. And of course, emergency information, it's easy to find. Um, I have some posters uh, that I created that I use in some of my workshops that have a lot of emergency information on different um, natural remedies, but then also Facebook sites that you can go to and ask questions in an emergency. We can ask questions anytime, but in an emergency, they'll respond quickly. Uh, also, uh, poison control numbers, the vet numbers, neighbor numbers, uh, any kind of numbers that when you're in an emergency situation, um, the last thing you want to do is try to gather the information. It needs to be right there, right now. So that's super important. So what are the goat vital signs? And again, this is important to know. As I said, have a little uh, notebook, which I do have. I have a notebook in the barn, and I also have a, a spreadsheet that I record things on uh, when different things are happening for each goat so that I can then, at the end of the year, lay down 
uh, kind of a template, and I can see, all right, who had the most struggles with their health, and that helps me determine who are the healthiest goats in the herd, because it doesn't always happen just because they look good. They may have had a big struggle all year, but there may be some that don't look as perfect, because I'm not looking for pedigree so much as I am what I call peace agree, which is how do we all get along? Uh, so anyway, so what's the pulse rate? What's the respiration rate? What's their average body temperature? And what's that movement of the rumen? How often uh, does it churn? And that the rumen we're talking about is that big rumen that is on the left side just uh, below their um, rib cage. And that rumen is the most important rumen really because that's where most of the activity happens and where when things go south and bloating happens, um, that it's, you know, you got to know. And I think I made a mistake earlier when I said that smaller goats have lower temperatures, and I didn't mean that. I meant to say they have higher temperatures. So but you're going to want to write that down. It doesn't take that long, and then you have that as a baseline to go back to. So let's say your goat's acting a little uh, off. Maybe she's standing off by herself, or heaven forbid, she's gone off feed. And once they go off feed, you know, this is big time emergency because goats are not humans. You know, humans start complaining, my back hurts, my arm hurts. By the time they're showing you something is wrong, this is an emergency. It isn't waiting to see what happens next. It is now an emergency. So the first thing you want to do is to go back and take that temperature and then go and look at what her normal temperature was if you don't know what it is, what is normal for her. And then listen to that rumen. You can hear it and how often it's moving and does she look bloated. So these are all easy things you can do to begin to analyze what is wrong with the goat. So the next slide is a picture of the goat uh, in terms of its, uh, its intestine, not intestine, its uh, stomachs. And it has four stomachs and they each serve a different purpose. When kids are born, uh, they don't need that uh, rumen, where it says rumen right there, the biggest part, the biggest stomach. They don't need it, but they do need it to develop. And so when they're going to nurse, they need to be in a position where their head is almost straight up. And what they're doing when they're nursing is their body is cutting off the opening to that rumen so that the um, milk which does not have to mix with anything to be digestible, goes in to the stomach that's going to uh, help them to break that milk down. You want to see that kid start to nibble on everything. Sometimes they'll come right out of the womb and start doing it, but you want them to nibble on the mom, the, the hay, any, anything, because that shows you that they're starting to get things material roughage, whatever, down into that rumen, and then the rumen begins to develop. If the rumen doesn't develop, they will die, and they will die at maybe two or three months and die a really bad death. So you want to make sure that they have material, other material to eat besides the milk. Um, one of the stomachs, the um, omasum, ha has the ability to grab a hold of um, pieces of material that don't belong in the goat, so pieces of metal, uh, maybe some plastic, and it will hold it there either until they, it's able to dissolve it or until the animal dies. So each stomach has a really important uh, place in the animal's life, those four stomachs, and then once all the material is, uh, the rumen is going to let me back up and say, the rumen is going to be, it is a giant fermentation vat. And when that food gets in there, it's mixed with uh, a lot of acid, and then it, the animal's going to regurgitate some of it back up and chew it some more to process it, and uh, then send it back to that rumen, and then that material is going to go into the reticulum and uh, be processed there, and then through the omasum to get rid of any metal. And I, I hope I'm saying, I hope I've got the stomachs right. Well, I know the rumen is right. And then the, the uh, abomasum, uh, say that twice really quickly, 
is where this, all of the rest of the digestion really takes place and then it passes into the small intestine. So sheep, cows, goats all have four stomachs. Llamas have three stomachs and goats actually are considered to be, not goats, rabbits are considered to be ruminant um, because in order to get full value out of their food, they uh, need to be able to poop and then eat the poop again to process the material. So nature is an amazing thing. So recognizing Annie, the sick goats. Annie, just so you know, we have about one or two minutes left. All right. Well, so we have one or two minutes left to answer questions or for me to talk. Uh, you can finish a slide or two. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, so let's skip on just real quickly to natural everyday things to do. I've already touched on that a little bit, but keeping a record of their temperature, of course, uh, understanding the role that copper and selenium play in that animal's life as a trace mineral, lots of things online about that. If you want to change the animal's feed, you've got to do it gradually over a week's time. Uh, otherwise, you're going to make them sick. I already talked about acidophilus. Apple cider vinegar is really great to spritz on to hay if you think there's a problem with the rumen not uh, having enough acidity. Kelp is the go-to for the different trace minerals I have uh, outlined there, especially if your soil test shows these areas to be low. Dolomite is great if there's bloat in the animal, which is common in goats, and you can put some of that down their throat, and it helps to reestablish the acidity level in the rumen so that it continues to work. And then lastly, diatomaceous earth. Uh, we use as a base for feeding some of the trace minerals, and we also dust that after we muck out on the floor because it, um, it kills off some parasites. Uh, so I'm just going to go to the end where it says questions answered, and um, we'll see what else comes up. Oh, thank you, Annie, very much. Yes, this, um, one thing I wanted to just clarify. So we had um, that question earlier about reed canary, canary grass, and um, Sherry wrote in and said that sheep, cattle, and horses would be better at controlling reed canary grass. Goats can eat reed canary grass, but need a alfalfa to counteract the um, elatoids with um <laughs> the sal saponins in the alfalfa. So that's, a, I know that yeah. was a question earlier in this, in this webinar. Um, we also had a question. Well, let me just much... say too, is that just that, that my answer was that it's not good to ever put it, put them in that situation where they're only eating grass. They aren't grass eaters. And if you get the wrong combination of grass, you can actually kill them. So that's great that she, that she did the science part for us. Yes, she has um, some research about that that I can share later too. Um, question okay. about how much space do, do you need to keep goats? Well, I, to answer that, you need to know what you're going to do with them. But if, you're, if you want to be humane, they've got to have space to roam. You know, people want to keep goats in the city or maybe they have an, an acre of ground. Um, in order for goats to be healthy, you've got to move them around so they're not in the same place all the time. They're not eating too low to the ground. Um, you know, that's a whole other webinar on pasture management. But um, I, 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 just from my personal opinion, I don't think goats belong in the city. They need to be able to live as naturally as they can. Another question about, are there any plants native to the Northeast that you know that would be troublesome, troublesome for a goat to forage off of, especially for kids developing their rumen? Um, well, there are a number of plants that goats are poisoned by. But I think the main thing, first of all, if they have what they need to eat, they're generally not going to eat enough of a plant to poison themselves. So, for example, um, ground cherries. They are allergic to ground cherries. And so, but if, if you have lots of ground cherries in the fall, maybe they would eat one, uh, you know, a leaf or something, but then they'll go on to the next thing if they have plenty of forage available. So that's the first thing. But some things that are a real problem for goats are 
uh, oak leaves of any kind, and they're, I think they're okay when they're green, but when they start to dry up in the fall, they are very poisonous. Also, any kind of fruit, tree leaves, even wild cherry, when they start to um, dry up and they're on the ground, if a goat eats very much of that, they, they can literally die. One of the things that I do is I have a place where I planted some maple trees, and um, they are... There's nothing else around, and so those are the leaves I gather and make sure they're good and dry, and I put them in feed bags, and I have that for snacks over the course of the winter. And I don't let my goats go into, well, I do pasture rotation, and they don't go where they're going to have contact with a lot of dried wild cherry or oak in the fall. Thank you for that, Annie. All right, so the last question for now, and I, I know that there are other people that have questions that I will put you in touch with Annie directly, but what are the best ways to deal with coyotes? <laughs> well, a good coyote is a dead coyote, but that's a, that sounds terrible, but honestly, um, I think it really comes down to having a, a livestock guardian dog. Um, I, I, and, and it's not always that, that easy to get a good one. And that dog has to stay with the animals all the time. It can't be in the house and things like that. I'm sure there are exceptions, but if they're really doing their job, they shouldn't be in the house. They need to be with the goats. Um, coyotes, neighbor's dogs. Um, even coons can kill a baby kid, jump on its head and drown it and eat it. Um, but I, I don't think you can stop coyotes if they want in unless you have, uh, if you've got a bad problem with that, you probably need two dogs. I have had guard llamas, and as long as there were two or more, they did a great job. But when they started to die off at some old age and then I just had one, they weren't, they didn't help me. And I know some people use donkeys, but frankly, I would be very nervous to use a donkey around goats, especially kids. They could kick them and, and kill them. Llamas are great with kids. But my, my llamas always felt like the, you know, they were the jungle gym and the kids would bounce off and all that stuff. But I think having, you could try having a really high fence with electric around the top if you've got the money to do that. But I think your only recourse is a, is a, a good aim with a gun and sitting out at night waiting on them or um, having a dog. And actually, that's a really good segue because next week we have a webinar about livestock guardian dogs um, for those of you that are interested in more about that topic. Um, so a few housekeeping items before we sign off. As I mentioned, a recording of the webinar and the slides will be available soon. I will be emailing that out to all of you. It will also be archived on our website um, along with some of the links that were referred to throughout the presentation. Um, and I do invite you all to join us for a future webinar. Like I said, next week, we are hosting a session on livestock guardian dogs. And then, and then in April, we are going to offer a webinar about raising pigs in an agroforestry system. All of our webinars are free, and you can register for as many or as few as you like. So I'm afraid that's all the time we do have for today. I want, I want to give a sincere thank you to you, Annie, for your really excellent presentation and for you know, taking the time to answer questions and uh, making yourself available to folks um, as a resource. And thank you to all, of, uh, all the folks in the audience for your attention and your, your interest in this topic. I hope that you all have a, a wonderful afternoon and that we are able to connect again soon. Goodbye. <laughs>